Hi guys, Jimmy McIntyre here and welcome to this essential guide for luminosity masks for beginners. Luminosity masks are a great way to blend exposures among other things. They're a much better alternative to HDR software, especially tone mapping. Now, if you're not sure about the differences between luminosity masks and HDR and why luminosity masks are more powerful, you'll see a link to a video in which I talk about exactly that in the description of this video. So on YouTube, if you scroll down in the description box, you'll see a load of links which I'm going to reference in this video. And you can browse those links as you wish. Now, the great thing about luminosity masks is that they give us really natural results. Now, you can, of course, continue post-processing and you might want a surreal feel or you might want a really realistic final result. But that's entirely up to you. What luminosity masks allow us to do is gain much finer control over our workflow in Photoshop. Now in this video, I'm going to show you a free piece of software that you can use for luminosity masks. And you can also download my example images that I show you in this video. And you can see a link to that again in the description of this video. Now, I want to show you some example images of before and after using luminosity masks. So to begin with, here we have a dark image with some underexposed shadows, but some really overexposed highlights here in the arches. Now, I used two exposures, a darker exposure and a brighter exposure, and I was able to recover those highlights and shadows in this final image here. And of course, I added some more adjustments to that too. Next, we have a few landscapes. So here is a seascape that I shot in New Zealand. And as before, we have some overexposed highlights and the rock here in the foreground is a little bit underexposed. So I use three exposures again, a brighter exposure and a darker exposure to bring back those highlights and shadows. And that's the final result. For my lavender field shot, here's the before image. You can see we have some overexposed highlights. And after post-processing, this is the final result. You see, we've recovered the highlights there and we've added some other effects too. And finally, here's another shot from New Zealand of Milford Sound. So we've got some really strongly overexposed highlights. The foreground is correctly exposed for. So I use two exposures and this is the final result. You see, we pull back those beautifully detailed clouds. And of course, I removed the boats in the foreground. And this thing here in the corner was from Ridley Scott's Alien movie. Uh, I had to remove that, of course. It didn't look very natural. So now that you've seen what luminosity masks can do, you've seen the before and after. We're gonna take some images into Photoshop and I'm gonna show you how to use them. So now, just before we begin, I wanna mention that luminosity masks are a particularly complicated thing at the beginning. If you're new to Photoshop and you're new to layers and masking, this is simply gonna to be too difficult for you. You'll find yourself getting really frustrated because you don't understand what's happening. So if you are new to Photoshop or you're new to masking, I suggest you go and watch some masking videos. I've got one in the description of this video that I made, which will give you some great information on how to use masks and what they are. And then I suggest that you experiment a lot with your images. People who usually come into luminosity masks have experience in HDR, experience in Photoshop, so the transition's a lot easier. Nevertheless, you can still watch this video and play along and maybe it'll click with you, maybe it won't. Now, I have three exposures in Photoshop. You should only have two of these if you've downloaded my images. I just choose three because I want to show you one quick thing. Now you'll see that they're all in different windows here so that we need to have them stacked as layers. Now if you're a Raya Pro user, this is my premium luminosity mask and workflow software. You would just press stack and that would stack them all as layers. But if you're using the easy panel, which is my free luminosity mask software, which is also really effective, you don't have that option. So instead, you see, I've got my base exposure here and I've got a darker exposure here. All I need to do is choose this move tool, left click on the darker exposure and drag that image up and hover it over the title here of my base exposure. Then I'm still keeping my left button down. I drag it into the middle of the image and I hold down shift. Then I let go of my left mouse button. By holding down shift, that centers the image. An alternative way, which is quicker, but doesn't really give you the benefits of working on a 16-bit image because it uses active selections is by copying and pasting. So we can press Command and A or Control and A on a PC and you see we have the marching ants here. Command and C or Control and C on a PC to copy that selection 
Then we go back to our base exposure and press Command and V or Control and V. And there we go. Now we've got all three exposures layered on top of each other. Now I always like to put my base exposure at the bottom. And we're going to build on top of that. If I had a brighter exposure, that would be my top layer. I very rarely use more than three exposures. Usually just two, sometimes three. Exposure blending in Photoshop doesn't require the same amount of exposures as tone mapping does. So two or three usually does the job. Now the first thing I want to discuss is luminosity masks themselves and how we make them. Well, you don't actually have to worry about that. Creating luminosity masks, a full set of brights, midtones, and darks, takes a long time. You can do that and create actions, but you really don't need to because we have the Easy Panel here. And like I mentioned, it's completely free. If you want to download the Easy Panel, you can see a link in the description of this video where you can download it and you can join my newsletter where I send you free tutorials like this. And the great thing about the Easy Panel, it also has other functions like detail enhancers, sharpness, or effects, things like that, which are very useful in your workflow. And as you can see, we have Raya Pro here, which is really the beast of luminosity masks. And we work mainly in a panel within Raya Pro called Instamask. And this is the professional luminosity mask panel. But for now, we're just going to use the easy panel in this tutorial. So when we talk about exposure blending in Photoshop, we mean that we're going to take multiple exposures of the same scene. You can do this with a single image, and I do have tutorials on YouTube about that but you take multiple exposures of the same scene and you blend them together so you recover the shadows and highlights. So we have a base exposure here and we have a darker exposure in the middle. Now, as you remember, we have three exposures here. And the reason why I added this third much darker exposure is because I want to show you what happens if you try to blend in exposures which are simply too dark. So one of the most important steps in the exposure blending process is deciding which exposures to use. So I choose a base exposure. This is the exposure that I consider my middle exposure, the one that is probably the best exposure that we have out of all of our brackets. And then after that, I just start recovering areas like the sky and any underexposed shadows. So in order to choose a darker exposure, which is suitable for the sky, I usually go for an exposure which is darker and has the sky recovered, but isn't too dark. And the reason why I do that is because if we try to blend in a, an exposure which is too dark into our base exposure, it won't look natural. And I just want to show you what that means for this particular scene. So we're not going to do any luminosity masks for now. I'm just going to do a crude selection using Photoshop selection tools. There we go. I've selected the sky. Then I'm going to choose the add a mask icon with this darker exposure selected and just make that visible. And you see that looks pretty good. It's not a bad selection at all. But actually when you zoom in, you start to see a lot of mistakes. And this is why luminosity masks are so important. Now, if I hold down Command on a Mac or Control on a PC and reselect that selection and choose my darker exposure, and I create a mask again and make the darker exposure visible, look at the difference in the blending. Look how unnatural it is. And that's because the darker exposure is simply too dark. It doesn't fit well with this base exposure. It's like putting a nighttime exposure and a daytime exposure together. It just isn't going to work. So we have to be careful in how we choose our exposures. And I talk about this a lot in my Art of Photography course and my Exposure Blend Like an Expert course. So for now, I'm going to delete this dark layer. And so we have our second darker exposure now. So I mentioned that if you zoom in, you start to see a lot of the mistakes when it comes to just blending using a crude selection tool. So we're going to zoom in and look along the edges here. It looks really unnatural. If we zoom along a little bit more, you can see there's this weird white bit here, which doesn't fit in at all. And if we zoom along to the bush, you can see there's a lot of mistakes. So what we need to do, if we just look at that mask that I created, here we have the white area, which is selected, of course, in the darker exposure. And here's the black area, which isn't selected in the darker exposure. So that's why we can see the base exposure in the foreground because it's not selected in the mask. So the reason why this blend doesn't look natural and has all these strange errors around the edges is because it's a really harsh mask. That's just based on some Photoshop algorithm that doesn't work in this context. What we need to do is to try and create a mask which is perfect for this scene. And the great thing is we already have the information in the scene for us to build the mask because we can build the mask purely through brightness. 
And that's what a luminosity mask is. It's a mask built around brightness. And the reason why that's so useful is that it allows us to make a gentle, softer mask, which creates a smooth transition between our exposures. So before you saw some horrible edging along the mountain, along the, the castle, but when you use luminosity masks, you can avoid that edging entirely. So what do I mean by building a mask around luminosity? So if I open up the easy panel, and you see here we have something called 16-bit bright LMs. Well, these are gonna create bright luminosity masks. And you see we have something called masks now, a folder. And watch what happens if we scroll through by pressing these buttons, the masks. We are getting more and more contrasting masks. So mask one is quite a general selection. Mask two gets more specific, more targeted towards the highlights. And as we move along, our selection becomes more restrictive. Now, when we're trying to choose a luminosity mask, we can choose the one which is going to give us naturally the best selection. So which one is going to give us a, a selection of the sky and not the foreground? So we want to take the sky from the darker exposure and place it into the base exposure, the sky and the base exposure. But we don't want the foreground to be affected too much. So, for example, if I go for, um, let's say, a six, a bright six, but first I go on to my darker exposure and I choose a black mask. So we create a black mask by holding down Alt on a PC or Option on a Mac and clicking the Add a Mask icon. And you see we've created a black mask. So now that layer is invisible. Now if I choose bright six, let's, let's say, and make selection, you see we now have this selection. So if I choose the mask, pick a brush, a white foreground, press Command and H or Control and H to hide the marching ants, watch what happens when I start painting in the sky. You see, we start recovering it. Now, I don't think it does a very good job. It does an okay job, but nothing special. It looks a little bit unnatural. And that's because the mask was a little bit too contrasting. That's our mask there. So although we do need to make a selection where the foreground is dark and not selected, we don't need the foreground to be too dark. So when we're choosing masks, it's best not to go with a mask that's really restrictive or that's too restrictive. So I'm going to press Command and D and Control and D, and that will deselect that active selection that we had. And I'm going to delete that mask. And I'm going to create another black mask on this darker exposure, just as I did before. And with the easy panel, let's do that again. So now with those masks created, we can cycle through again and this time go for a mask which has a decent selection of the sky. So most of the sky is white or light gray, but the foreground is a dark gray or black. It's not as contrasting as the bright six there. So we have a less restrictive mask, a more open mask. If I went for, let's say, a bright one and chose make selection and of course selected the black mask before, and start painting in. It looks great in the sky. We're doing a really good job of bringing back those clouds, but you see we're affecting the foreground too. But if I paint there, we're darkening the foreground. So there's before and after. Look at the path here, loses some contrast. So that didn't work either. That's too open, too general a mask. So instead of that, we can try brights too. I'm gonna to create my black mask again option on a Mac and left click on that add a mask button or alt on a PC and now I'm going to create my masks again and this time I'm going to choose brights too and make selection and with a white brush selected I'm going to press on the mask press command and H or control and H to hide these marching ants and then I'm just going to paint in the mask and the great thing about luminosity masks when you use selections like this is that you can go over that area multiple times. So you can reinforce your selection. I'm not exactly sure why we can do that, but it's extremely useful in exposure blending. So look, I'm painting over this area multiple times and maybe in the water a little bit too. And here is the before and after. Look at how we're not affecting the castle in the background. Even though we painted over it multiple times, we're not really affecting it. We're not affecting the foreground. Now I'm going to press the zoom tool and I'm going to zoom in here. Remember the edging that we saw before from the last selection? You see it doesn't exist anymore. 
and look at the edging around the tree. Before we had these white marks all around the tree, but look how beautifully that's now blended in, before and after. Even when there's some movement in the trees, the blending still looks really natural. Although if you really zoom in, you can see this slight black edging. And it's quite easy to fix that, but that's for a different tutorial. This is a beginner's tutorial. And if we zoom into the castle, look at how perfect the blend is there. There's no edging whatsoever. And the great thing is, unlike tone mapping software, we haven't affected the colors, the sharpness, or anything. There's no extra noise. We are still working with the exact same files that we had before, and there's no image degradation. It's just as sharp, and the colors are just as natural. So that's how easily we can blend exposures with luminosity masks. Now, I just want to go back a little bit just to talk about one of the things that I did. I'm going to delete this mask and talk about actually creating the luminosity mask. So when I created the luminosity masks, you'll notice that I put a black mask on this darker exposure or I made the darker exposure invisible. There's a very good reason for that. When we create luminosity masks, those masks are based around whatever big image we see here. So if I create my bright luminosity masks, the first mask, Brights 1, will be an exact replica of this image here. And I'll show you what I mean. Here we go. So there's the black and white version of our colored image there. Absolutely identical. And since we want to make a good selection of the sky, we have to use the base exposure in this example to build our mask around. Because in our base exposure, the sky is nice and white. And remember, the areas we want to select in our mask need to be white or light gray. So in our base exposure, those areas are quite bright. So it's quite easy to make that selection. But what happens, let's say if I delete those masks, what happens if I create the masks around the darker exposure? So I've made the darker exposure visible. I press 16-bit bright LMs. And now if I go to Brights 1, look at how dark that image is compared to the other one. Before, when I press Brights 1, we had this great selection of the sky. But in this example, we don't have that at all. We have quite a lot of information in the sky, so that's not going to allow us to make a good selection of the sky. And that's because, of course, our darker exposure also has a lot of information in the sky, so it just doesn't give us that selection. Now, if that's confusing to you, don't worry. Just follow this general rule and it'll work most of the time. When you have your base exposure at the bottom and your darker exposure on top, make your darker exposure invisible. So you can do that by adding a black mask or just pressing this icon here. And build your mask around the base exposure that's visible. And that's it. Now what about the other masks? Well, if we want to swap this around and now we have the base exposure on top, we might be able to create some dark luminosity masks. And you notice I still have my bright exposure visible because that still gives us the best selection which will separate the sky and the foreground. Now look at our darks masks. It's basically just an inverted version of our bright masks. Exactly the same. So if I choose my bright exposure and I create a black mask on there and choose darks too and make selection, now I can Press Command and H and Control and H to hide the marching ants, but I can paint in the foreground, you see, to brighten up that area in the darker exposure. So this time I'm swapping the foreground for the brighter exposure with that of the darker exposure. So we can do it any way we want. I prefer to put the base exposure at the bottom, especially if we're working with three exposures but we can be flexible with how we do it. And we can still come out with a really natural blend. And this is what our mask looks like, just in case you're curious. Now, if you want to work purely in 16-bit and you don't want to use any sort of selection, we do have a quicker way of applying our masks, and these are 16-bit masks. So whenever you use an active selection like that, even if you're working in 16-bit, the active selection is always in 8 bits. There's no getting around that, unfortunately. It's simply a limitation of Photoshop. But we can get around it in the sense that we can create our masks and simply apply them directly to the layer. So let me show you what I mean. I'm going to make that darker exposure invisible, choose my bright exposures just as we did last time. And just as before, I'm going to go to Brights 2. And now you can see our Brights 2 mask. I'm going to select our darker exposure and just choose Apply Mask. And so now we've blended those exposures. You see, there's the before and after. Now it doesn't quite look as good because the problem with applying the mask 
directly to the image is that it's applied to the entire image but also we don't get the benefits of being able to go over the mask multiple times to reinforce our selection. Before when we had the marching ants we could paint over the same area a couple of times just to bring through more of those clouds but in this example we can't. So you see in the mask we have some darker areas in the clouds so that's not bringing through all of those lovely detail clouds in the darker exposure. So usually I recommend painting in the mask using um, the make the selection option. And we won't use this now, but we also have something called 16-bit mid-tone luminosity masks. And those are selecting primarily the mid-tones, as you can guess. And this is what the mid-tone masks look like. Now, I'm going to show you one more example of how we can exposure blend with luminosity masks, but we can also use luminosity masks for a lot of different ways. Because we're making selections using brightness, we can add, for example, warmth just to highlights or cold tones just to shadows. We can add extra details to our shadows or extra details just to our mid-tones. The possibilities are almost limitless with luminosity masks. But now let me show you the next example very quickly. Okay, so here we have a darker exposure on top and a brighter exposure on the bottom. So that's our base exposure on the bottom. We want a nice bright image so we can get these cool light trails along here. Now, I actually think we could probably just do this with one exposure, but I think it's a good example uh, to show you how to exposure blend. So I'm going to zoom in and we've got the darker exposure visible. Now, if we make that invisible, you see we have some overexposed areas there in the building, in front of us, and to the right here. So we want to make a good selection which will only target the brightest parts of this image. Now, before we chose a slightly less restrictive mask, but now I'm going to choose a more restrictive mask. So again, I'm making my darker exposure invisible. I'm creating some bright luminosity masks. And now we can cycle through our masks. If I go for something like a bright swan, so I'm going to create a dark mask on my darker exposure. Then I go for bright swan and I choose make selection. Choose the mask, white paintbrush, hide the marching ants. And look, if I paint, you can see we're darkening the sky around the building. So there's the before and after. And that isn't what we want. We just want to affect the area in the top of the building there. So we want a very restricted selection this time. So I'm going to deselect any marching ants I have and choose my luminosity masks again. And now we're going to cycle through and we're going to look for a selection which chooses just the areas in the building and not the sky. So look at brights one, that's too general. Brights two is also a little bit too general. Because the sky is still about 50% gray, I think that might be affected. But if we choose a brights three, I think that's going to give us a really good selection because the sky around the building is dark and only the lights are selected. So if I press make a selection, choose the black mask just as before, press command and HL control and H to hide the marching ants. And I'm going to choose a smaller brush. And then with an opacity of 100%, I'm just going to paint in that building. And you see we're not going around the edges at all. All of the changes are staying within the building. Now I should point out actually a really important point is to make sure your flow is at 100% and smoothing if you're using CC 2018 is also set to 100%. If you don't have flow to 100%, your blending is going to come out really patchy. So try and remember to keep flow at 100%. Now with this building, I'm going to choose a slightly larger brush. And just paint in that information there. And now I'm going to zoom in, let's say into this area here, with a large brush. And we're just going to recover some of those areas too. And maybe some areas in the street in the foreground, in the shop sign. You see, we're keeping within our selection the whole time. And what about this shop front here? There we go. So as you can see, sometimes there is a very important use for more restricted masks. We don't always go for a more general mask. Sometimes restrictive masks are really important too. And that concludes our beginner's guide to luminosity masks. Now, as I mentioned before, this is a particularly complex thing. And I move quite quickly here to cover a lot of information in this tutorial. If you want to take your post-processing further, I have lots of free tutorials on YouTube, but I also have an exposure blend like an expert course which teaches you how to use exposure blending with Raya Pro and I have the art of photography where you don't need Raya Pro and that teaches you shooting 
and really advanced post-processing. But that's a little bit more on the advanced side. But until then, I hope you've enjoyed this tutorial and I hope it's made you curious about taking this a little bit further. Like I mentioned, there are some more challenges you're gonna face along the way, but you have a few more skills with which to approach them. And if you get stuck, the internet's definitely your friend here. So thank you very much for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it.